So like Ellie said, I'm going to be talking about HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Um, so I've titled this Stay Prepared with PrEP. Um, like Ali said, my name is Molly Lothi. I'm one of the PGY1 clinical residents. Um, and thank you so much, Jill Strayer, for being my content expert on this presentation. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some learning objectives for everybody. So I want you all to be able to explain the prevalence of HIV transmission, describe some of the differences in the patient demographics. Um, we'll go over some of the importance of pre-exposure prophylaxis with some safety and efficacy data points. And then the bulk of the presentation is really going to be about comparing the available or FDA approved and then the developing or kind of in the pipeline prep formulations and then some different dosing strategies too. So those are the big takeaways here. So out of the way. Oh, okay. All righty. So, first, we'll review the prevalence and some demographic information for HIV. I'm thinking this will kind of help set the scene for our discussion on PrEP and its importance. So, in regards to prevalence, the CDC has some really fantastic data regarding HIV. It's released every couple years. Um, so, for our first statistic here, per the CDC in 2020, 30,635 people received an HIV diagnosis in the U.S. So, to me, that was pretty staggering. Um, how does that compare in previous years? You can see it's actually a decrease. So, from 2016 to 2019, it's decreased by about 8%. And it's largely decreased due to a movement that I'll discuss in the next couple of slides. Um, this last statistic here in regards to prevalence and estimated well, about 1.2 million people in the U.S. had HIV at the end of 2019. Of those people, about 87% knew they had HIV. So this statistic I just wanted to highlight to kind of drive home the point that while, yes, PrEP is super important for patients who have an identified HIV positive partner, it's increasingly important then for patients who meet these several risk factors that I'll talk about because 13% of these patients didn't know that they were HIV positive and are at risk of spreading. So moving into some HIV transmission common modalities, just to highlight again per the CDC, male to male sexual contact is the primary transmission at 68%, followed by heterosexual contact and then injection drug use. And then there's this kind of compounded male to male with injection drug use. So it, you know, it's not surprising to kind of know these transmission pathways drive a lot of our risk factor groups that are guideline recommended to start PrEP, which again, I kind of keep alluding to, but we'll discuss. Um, another thing to highlight is male to male sexual contact has historically been super well documented and well studied. Um, we received the first indication for PrEP, um, but now when we kind of talk about these new medications that are in the pipeline, um, they'll focus more on heterosexual contact because um, you can see that still makes up almost a quarter of the transmission, so super significant. Moving into HIV diagnosis, kind of its regional distribution, um, you can see incidence of HIV diagnosis is certainly not created equal, um, not evenly distributed regionally. Um, oh, I did want to note that these rates in the graphic are per 100,000 people on the graphic there. Um, it would be great if there was just six people in the Midwest that were diagnosed with HIV in 2020. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, you'll notice that, you know, the Midwest has proportionally smaller amounts of patients being diagnosed with HIV compared to the South. Um, the South is also larger, more geographically dispersed of people living with HIV. So this, you know, kind of how it's geographically dispersed creates some unique challenges. So the federal government definitely uses kind of these data points to allocate different resources, which is, which is helpful. Next thing I wanted to move into was the demographics. So I'll talk about age first. Just wanted to touch on how young people aged 13 to 24, which I thought was pretty young, actually account for the majority of diagnoses, over half at 57%. Um, also wanted to note some right, racial and ethnic differences in regards to HIV incidence. So you can see on this chart here, kind of um, following from the top, African-Americans have the highest incidence followed by Hispanic, and then followed by white. So those three races make up the, the bulk of the diagnoses. So this next slide um, is the movement that I alluded to earlier in regards to why we're kind of hopefully starting to see a decrease 
in the HIV incident. So this is a bold initiative to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. It spans across the US Department of Health and Human Services, as I kind of noted there. Um, and it highlights really four main um, like topics to target. Diagnosis being the first or like the first action. So HIV testing um, focuses on these high burden areas. Um, which the CDC notes the top 57 counties that account for more than 50% of the new HIV diagnoses. So diagnosis is, is also difficult and testing is certainly not optimal, but the CDC um, and their guidelines recommend all people between the ages of 13 to 64 be tested for HIV at least once in a healthcare setting. Um, then you move on to treatment. So this focuses on with any new HIV positive test, just linking those patients to treatment just as soon as possible. So there's a couple of different modalities that the CDC recommends um, for, for, for that route. Um, prevention, so this is where we're really gonna spend the remainder of our conversation today, but there's numerous interventions that exist to stop the spread of HIV. And then respond quickly. So this is an underlying theme to all the initiatives really, you know, the faster we act, the more patients we can diagnose, treat, and then prevent transmitting infections too. But like I mentioned, prevention is really where we're gonna spend the, the bulk of our conversation today. So moving into PrEP usage, again, from the CDC in 2020, about 25% of that 1.2 million people for whom PrEP is recommended for, so falling in those risk categories, were actually prescribed it, so 25%, compared to only 3% in 2015. So we're definitely increasing and improving from 2015, but still, this is still pretty jarring statistic and room for improvement. So on these, these graphics here, you'll see a breakdown using colors. So red for persons with an indication for PrEP, while blue indicates the patient has a prescription for PrEP. So taking a closer look here at the breakdown of race and ethnicity, you'll see there's still a huge disparity, specifically in African-American as well as Latino. Remember those were our, our top um, ethnicities to target for, for PrEP. Um, PrEP is still different. Age groups is also listed here. So keep note, remember that age group where the most incidence of HIV was in 13 to 24. So may have expected higher rates of indications in that group. And then the last graphic here I have by sex. So you see that males do make up a majority of the prescriptions, largely just due to their increased risk. Um, I know I don't have it listed here, but just to drive home the importance of PrEP, PrEP does reduce the risk of getting HIV from sex by 99%, and PrEP reduces the risk of getting HIV from in injection use by at least 74%. So really important to increase utilization here for all the folks who are indicated. Why is it so hard? Um, Tons of PrEP barriers that we're, you know, actively trying to improve on. First one is stigma. There, I mean, social stigma, provider stigma, patient stigma, you name it. There's just a ton of stigma surrounding PrEP. Conversations about sexual orientation, risky behavior, IV drug use, just make people uncomfortable. And it's, you know, I don't blame providers or anything like that. The best solution is truthfully just, just education. I was on a call a couple of weeks ago and for, for Wisconsin PrEP usage, and a provider um, kind of compared, uh, you know, HIV risk and PrEP usage just as the same as starting a patient on an antihypertensive if a patient's blood, push, blood pressure is elevated. So I think that's a really fair kind of correlation and great to bring up with providers as well. But bottom line, best solution is education. So I think everyone here is doing kind of the first step for education. <laughs> um, the next barrier would be access. Um, this could be access to a provider, medica medications. Um, for a provider, I think the Wisconsin Department of Health um, have made, made some significant strides here. Their website has a kind of a PrEP locator tool. It links patients up with clinics that have PrEP navigators, uh, social workers, providers with knowledge, um, and importantly, it kind of breaks down that first barrier of stigma. These providers have no stigma associated with PrEP and are, are very knowledgeable. With medications, some meds are more difficult to gain access to than others, which I'll kind of discuss more when we talk about those kind of different interventions. Um, the next prep barrier here is side effects. So I'll go over the potential side effects in depth when we talk about each, each agent, but education will be a huge piece here too for providers and patients. Um, 
cost is the next barrier here. So for each intervention I talk about, um, I'll discuss the different cost, more so implications. Um, there's been big strides as far as it being a barrier, but generally insurance you know, dictates a lot of what is actually covered. If a patient is uninsured, the state of Wisconsin does have Badger Care, which you all are probably more uniquely familiar with than, than, I, than I am, um, but it does cover PrEP. Um, if a patient doesn't meet criteria, there are a variety of other different assistance programs too that can be applied for. Um, and then ultimately kind of bottom line for cost too is trying to reduce cost with the Affordable Care Act in 2019. Um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force actually mandated insurance coverage for PrEP, all the lab monitoring too required, um, so cost wouldn't be prohibitive, prohibitive. So lots of kind of strides to make cost not one of the main barriers for PrEP. Lastly would be awareness. Um, I actually came across a survey that was given at an annual conference with 271 nurse practitioners where 60% reported no prior prep training or education, and 62% of those reported never starting a conversation about prep. So I'm thinking, you know, since we work at an academic medical center, we can set these trainees up for success. We can start these conversations with providers, um, you know, on interventions. So again, this, this solution bottom line is just really education again. So I kind of link awareness, side effects, stigma in my mind with bottom line of just being education um, and then access and cost have a bit more logistics and working with insurance and patient specific. So getting into our first knowledge check here, not quite setting up for failure, but we haven't specifically covered this yet. We'll start going into the guidelines next. Um, but what or which patient is not eligible for PrEP? Is it a patient who had vaginal sex two months ago with an HIV positive partner? patient who uses shared injection equipment with an HIV positive partner, a patient who has a history of inconsistent or no condom use with sexual partners, patient who had anal sex three months ago with a partner who tested positive for chlamydia, or do all of these patients meet eligibility for PrEP? You can put it in the chat. I cannot see the chat, but I have full faith. Everybody will get this right. Looks like lot of ease, Molly. Crushed it. <laughs> um, so everybody got it right then. Um, it is E. All of these patients would be eligible and we'll kind of work through the different prep indications here. Um, but again, bottom line, there is a 2021 update to the prep guidelines and it really broadened and simplified who would be indicated for prep. So using their exact wording here for both men and women, PrEP is recommended in adults and adolescents weighing at least 35 kilograms who report sexual behaviors that place them at substantial ongoing risk of HIV exposure and acquisition. So it's really any type of risky behavior. So if a patient mentions it to you, brings it up in conversation, absolutely dive into that conversation. Um, the guidelines do a really good job of um, kind of describing what some of those risky behaviors might look like. So I just copy and pasted it from this in this trip below. So kind of describing that sexual activity, adults and adolescents, um, anal or vaginal sex in the past six months. So really just any type of um, sexually active adult or adolescent in the last six months, if they have an HIV, po HIV positive sexual partner, if they've had an STI in the past six months, or just a history of inconsistent or no condom use. Um, and then also if you have a patient who injects drugs um, or shares injection equipment. So the way I kind of back up and look at that from a pharmacist role, um, so on admit um, or on chart review, you know, we can see dispense history for the last six months. Um, so any medications that would maybe hint at a treatment of STI, any notes discussing IV drug use, um, I think those would be really meaningful interventions on rounds for, for a great prep discussion. So finally, we'll get into some prep options here now that we've covered some demographic information and the importance of prep. Oh, actually, first, I just wanted to show you these prep guidelines, kind of make a plug form here. Um, just add the link to the 2021 um, update. So this guideline is completely comprehensive. It lists all the current recommendations, um, indications, interventions, and all the monitoring. We'll walk through all of that today, but it's just a really great tool to walk back through. So I want to make sure those were included in the, the slide deck here. 
Okay, now we'll get into the available options. So we have two FDA approved oral options that we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about one recently approved injectable option. And then I have quite a few, um, more of a bird's eye view of the investigational products. A couple that are in the pipeline, one that's kind of stuck in the pipeline, um, just so you're aware of it in case you get any questions. First, let's move into our oral options. So we have Truvada and Discovi. Um, TDF, FTC, and TAF, FTC. Only difference is the tenofovir component. They're both nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So they're just working to prevent replication. Um, the first guy here is Truvada. So Truvada was approved in July of 2012 for PrEP. So we'll talk about the different clinical trials that led to the approval and different risk groups. But Truvada is indicated for all of the listed risk groups. Um, Discovi, on the other hand, it was approved in October of 2019 for PrEP. Um, so Discovi's effectiveness, it hasn't been studied in female patients um, yet who are at risk of getting HIV through vaginal sex, so it's lacking that indication. So I did want to add a little uh, dollar sign here just to bring up um, not necessarily a cost barrier, but just kind of a cost comparison. So Truvada is available as a generic, Discovi is brand only. So due to the Affordable Care Act that I mentioned earlier, the 2019 preventative um, kind of uh, note or implication, um, both have to be available with a $0 copay. So for an example, on quartz insurance, Truvada's brand is non-formulary, but the generic is available at $0 and Discovi is also available at $0. So how to kind of differentiate these, you know, how do you pick aside from maybe an indication? Um, there are a couple of renal impairment considerations. As I had mentioned, the only difference really is, is the tenopavir comp component, either TDF or TAF. Um, there are some dose adjustments based off renal function for each of these options. Um, so tenopavir affects the kidney in a couple different ways. So it can actually cause kidney injury, but it also can cause this kind of artificial decrease in GFR. So kidney injury, it, it can certainly cause um, like kidney injury at the proximal um, like tubulopathy injury, but it all, can also cause artificial decrease um, in the GFR just by interfering with like tubular creatinine secretion. So a couple different ways it can affect your kidneys and we dosed it based off that. Um, so TDF actually has been shown to cause um, a greater risk of kidney injury. So that's just why it has this higher creatinine clearance cutoff. So TDF is that Truvada, so TDF FTC. So it's approved for patients with a creatinine clearance of greater than 60. TAF FTC, the Discovi on the other hand, is approved for patients with a creatinine clearance of greater than 30. So you have a little more flexibility there with a the Discovi. So just, you know, bottom line here is just use caution in patients with renal dysfunction. Monitor really closely and may have a little more flexibility with that Discovi if you have a patient with renal impairment. Common side effects, um, generally very well tolerated and it's similar between both oral options, so I didn't really separate them here. It's, it's similar and just by a couple different percentages, maybe one or two. Most common is gonna be GI discomfort or diarrhea, nausea, and then headache and fatigue. So pretty well tolerated. Drug interactions, um, can't have a pharmacy discussion without talking about drug interactions. Um, for FTC, TDF, or Truvada, there's really no major drug interactions. Um, I did put a note here just to consider caution with, you know, nephrotoxic drugs um, or decreased renal function just because it has that higher creatinine clearance cutoff at 60, unlike the Discovi, remember, with the 30. Um, for Discovi, it is a substrate um, of some drug transporters and PGP, um, so you have to be careful with some um, inducers and inhibitors um, like the anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine, phenobarb, phenytoin, and then rifampin, rifapentine as well, so be careful with those. All right, let's get into some of these clinical trials and what led to the approval of each. So IPREX, um, so I'm gonna go over four landmark trials. IPREX in 2010 was really um, the first approval for oral PrEP. Um, IPREX was a double blind placebo controlled. It was a phase three clinical trial. It was in men who have sex with men and transgender women. Um, this was uh, in Truvada. 
and we saw an overall reduction in HIV incidence uh, was 44% in that Truvada arm. So uh, statistically significant, clinically significant. So this led to the approval of Truvada for PrEP. Um, also did want to note too, uh, patients who took Truvada 90% uh, or more of the days during the course of the study actually had 73% reduction in incidence. So no surprise there, um, adherence is super important. <laughs> Um, but noting that the population studied was men who have sex with men, we still didn't know, you know, individuals who engage in heterosexual sex. So our next study was Partners Prep. This was another randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. It's actually three arm and had TDF um, standalone as well as Truvada. Um, and this showed an HIV. Uh, relative reduction or overall risk reduction of 75%. So this covered that next uh, population of heterosexual men and women, so gained that indication. So now everyone's probably thinking, what about our next risk group? What about the IV drug use? So that led us to the bangkok tenofovir study um, for persons who inject drugs. So this was randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, enrolled volunteers who reported injecting drugs during the previous year. Um, and there was actually an overall risk reduction of HIV incidence of 48.9%. Um, did want to note the agent used was just TDF, but uh, the CDC uses this as a very high level um, for recommendations for patients who inject drugs for both oral PrEP options. Last but not least, Discover PrEP. Um, this was a randomized, double-blind, multi-center active control. It was phase three. It was actually the non-inferiority trial between uh, Discovy and Truvada. Um, we just have analysis from baseline through 96 weeks. HIV incidence rates um, had Discovy at 0.16 per 100 person years compared to 0 0.3 um, per 100 person year. So um, again, bottom line, Truvada and Discovy it was found to be non-inferior to, for Truvada. Um, or excuse me, sorry, not inferior to Truvada. So this gained Discovy's um, indication for oral PrEP. What we still don't know, like I had previously mentioned, was heterosexual men and women. So that's why it's, um, it's not indicated for vaginal sex. This trial is actively um, going on right now and expected to be completed as early as 2024. So still more to come with, with Discovy. Okay. So I guess I haven't necessarily um, mentioned how they were uh, dosed in these trials, but daily I think is most intuitive. So they were um, they had previously been studied as daily in all of these trials. Daily is the only FDA approved dosing strategy, but there is another dosing strategy. So there's on demand or event driven. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next um, next few slides here. Um, again, did want to note that this is not approved by the FDA. It's actually recommended by the World Health Organization, though. So you can find information on the strategy in the 2021 PrEP guideline update. So what is on-demand PrEP really look like? Um, it's also called 211 or event-driven. It's not taken daily. So as listed here, it's really just taken around a planned sexual event. So you take two pills, two to 24 hours prior to the sexual event, as I have listed here. Then you take one pill 24 hours after the first pill. So it's not in relation to the sexual event. It's always in relation to when you took the first pill. So again, you take one pill 24 hours after the first pill, and then you take another one pill 48 hours after that first pill. So that's why it's the 211, two, 211 method. Um, two pills, two to 24 hours prior, one pill 24 hours after the first pill, and then one pill 48 hours after the first pill. If you have multiple consecutive sexual encounters, you would just continue to take one pill per day until it's been 48 hours after the last encounter. Like I said, you can find information on this dosing strategy in the PrEP guidelines, but it's not approved by the FDA and it's not recommended by the CDC. Um, and this has only been studied with Truvada. It has not been studied with Discovy. So let's kind of walk through the, the trial that was studied. So the trial name was Hypergay. It was double blind randomized study of the on-demand prep. And it was, like I said, just Truvada versus placebo and men who have sex with men or transgender women. So again, excluding kind of our other identified risk groups, um, such as IV drug users or hetero. Um, it did find an 86% reduction rate of HIV infection in the on-demand PrEP group, as you can see in that graphic there. Um, I did want to note a couple of study limitations, though. So I had a pretty low participation population. Um, and what was kind of interesting was the median number of doses was 15 tablets per month. 
And this was pretty close. It was four tablets per week has been known to produce high levels of protection during daily dosing. So it kind of brought to light the question of was it the higher rate of dosing was the main contributor or was this on-demand dosing equally as effective? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's probably why it has not been approved by the, the CDC or FDA. Okay, next knowledge check here. True or false, the only oral prep dosing regimen that is FDA approved is daily. So we've talked about a couple of different dosing regimens. Are they both FDA approved or is it just daily? Lots of trues, Molly. Awesome. Yep. Um, so it sounds like I haven't lost you yet. Um, out of the couple of different options between daily and on demand, um, remember on demand, event driven, 211, all meaning the same thing. This is not FDA approved, although um, the uh, World Health Organization do currently back it, but not the FDA. All right. So we have made our way through oral prep. Um, we're just going to talk about the one newly approved injectable option here. Okay, so our injectable option is cabotegravir or apertude. Um, so same uh, risk categories that it's approved in, men and women, um, adolescents with that same weight restriction of at least 35 kilograms. It's actually an intramuscular gluteal injection. It's administered by healthcare professionals, so it's not approved for self-injection at home. Um, I have the dosing strategy listed on the bottom here and what that would look like. We have this optional oral cabotegravir daily four weeks um, prior to the first injection lead in. This is only to assess tolerability of cabotegravir prior to administering the IM cabotegravir. So it's completely optional. Um, if you do the optional oral, you would administer the IM initiation injection on the last day of oral lead in or within three days. That's only if you do the oral cab. Um, so then, you know, if you do or you don't, you have your first aperture dose. The following month, you would have follow up and have that second injection. Then you'd continue with follow up every two months. So it's great for adherence. You're only following up every two months for this injection. You don't have an oral tablet to take. Um, uh, it's really great patient satisfaction. You all, I should note, you also have have a seven day before and after scheduled dose grace period because um, you know life happens. Life happens here. Um, I do have an access barrier note here that I want to talk about. So access for oral cabotegravir, it is only available through Theracom Pharmacy. So we can't order it from wholesalers at local pharmacy, which does make it more difficult to get. Um, Theracom does provide the lead-in weeks for free. And then another company, though, Viev, covers the cost of cabotegravir for oral bridging which I know I haven't discussed what exactly the uh, indications for oral bridging would be yet. I'll talk about that when we talk about missed dosage, dosages, um, but just wanna um, kind of mention that cost for oral cab really isn't an issue, but it's more so access because you have to go through this Theracom pharmacy. For IM cabotegravir, it's more so an issue with reimbursement. So IM cabotegravir becomes an issue it, just because reimbursement's not super straightforward, patients' insurance can dictate whether they want to bill through pharmacy or medical benefits. Um, I got kind of lost in all of this when I was doing some, some research for this presentation. Um, Via Connect, that um, same company that helps with the cost for oral cab for bridging, has this really great resource, an entire document on reimbursement pathways, um, whether a patient is able to bill through pharmacy or medical benefits. Um, so, for an example, in the HIV clinic here, Apertude for, for Cab for PrEP, and then Cabanuva is actually the, uh, the product for uh, HIV treatment. They're both billed through medical benefits and administered in the clinic. Other places like Freydert are doing it in their infusion center. So, while there might be some availability with Apertude for pharmacy benefits, it really just depends what the insurance wants. Our clinic doesn't really allow patients to bring in the med, um, so there's just some extra barriers there. Um, while reimbursement has somewhat been maneuvered for Apertude, I think the takeaway from all of this is really, um, you know, we're still learning the best way to bill, but as these new medications come to market that we'll talk about, it's really just learning the best way to reimburse for those. So access does not always 
become a barrier. I think that's the most important thing. So next thing I want to talk about is side effects. Um, the biggest side effect and something to discuss with patients as to what to certainly expect is pain at the injection site for 24 hours after the injection. Um, headache and GI upset is also possible, but it's really important to stress that pain at the injection site. Next thing is drug interactions. I know we covered this for oral prep, but just to round out with the cabotegravir as well. Um, it's metabolized by UGT1A1, so you really just have to worry about the strong inducers. Um, the contraindicated medications are listed here. Uh, same the, con the anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, oxycarbamazepine, phenobarb, phenytoin, um, and still watching out for rifampin, rifapentine as well. Okay, so I know I kind of alluded to there's a plan for missed dosages or missed injections, whether it's planned or unplanned. So let's go through the planned missed injections first. So remember the patient does have a seven day grace period before and after the dose. So like I said, you know, life happens. So say your patient is going out of country for two months. So they'll miss their March 2023 dose. What do you do? So the patient here is able to receive their January 2023 dose. Starting the day their scheduled dose is due, start oral cabotegravir. So this is that bridging. This can be continued for up to two months. But consider, you know, if the patient is unable to come in for an additional two months, that would be four months since their last visit. So beyond two months, the aptitude just might not be the best option for that patient. Um, so oral cab can be considered or continued for two months. But if you're going far beyond that, oral prep might be the better option. Um, but, you know, there is a plan for any planned misinjections. I did link this website down here too. The Apertude, um, the healthcare website has a really great um, kind of chart for all the dosing, whether it's planned or unplanned. So, a really great resource for everybody too. Next is unplanned. So, I have it in the chart here, but just to kind of summarize, it's really dependent on if it's the second injection or if it's the third or beyond. So, if it is that second injection, you have to ask yourself, has it been less than two months? If it's been less than two months, you just administer the dose as soon as possible and then just follow the normal dosing regimen. If it's been greater than two months since the first dose, you just have to restart the dosing schedule. So they'd follow up in a month and restart from there. If it's the third injection or greater, so it might be the third injection, it might be the 20th injection, just third or greater, you have to ask yourself, has it been less than three months? then administer as soon as possible and resume the norming do normal dosing schedule? Or has it been greater than three months? In that case, again, you would restart the dosing schedule with the injection the following month and restart from there. And again, these are all um, on the Apertude website with a, with a really nice chart. That brings us to our next knowledge check with a patient example. So say if a patient receiving the following Apertude dosing regimen, so they came in on March 15th, got their first dose, came in a month later, got their second dose, came in two months later, got their third dose. So following their normal dosing regimen. Then they missed a couple, came in on September 9th. So do some math, figure out how long it's been. What should be their new dosing schedule? Do they no longer qualify? Should you administer as soon as possible, then just follow the normal dosing schedule, or should you have to completely restart and follow up with that first month? Looks like B, Mo. That's what oh, people nice. are putting in the chat. This takes some math, so I'm. I'm proud. <laughs> um, yeah, it's B. Um, so this would be our fourth dose. Um, so falling under that second category. So patient followed up like just under three months. So therefore they can just receive their dose today, resume the normal dosing regimen um, just every two months. So awesome. Okay, so let me go over some of the clinical trials that led to the injectable prep um, uh, approval. So there were really two key clinical trials. There is HPTN083 and then 84. So 83 was the randomized double blind non-inferiority trial in cisgender men and transgender women. 84 was double blind superiority in just cisgender women. Um, both trials, they had the same intervention I listed down here. So you had the oral lead-in with CAB or Truvada. 
um, patients received either CAB, if they had previously received CAB as a lead-in, or Truvada, they received the Truvada. And then there's just open-label Truvada as well. So, um, with 83, it was stopped early due to superiority. Um, and this was pretty jarring, I feel like. Approximately three times the number of incident HIV infections were in the Truvada arm than in the CAB arm. Um, so, this led to the approval of Apertude. In the 84, it was also stopped early due to superiority. Um, and even larger, nine times the number of incident HIV infections were in the Truvada arm than the CAB arm. So pretty effective clinically and significantly. All right, so moving away from our FDA approved options, just to kind of round out with some monitoring before we move into the um, kind of in the pipeline and, and research and development. Uh, for HIV has to be monitored, so or has to be tested. So patients have to have uh, HIV negative prior to starting PrEP. So it's checked at baseline and throughout treatment for oral and injectable. Um, lipids also have to be checked. I included that here, um, just in oral. So in the DISCOVER trial that I talked about uh, that got DISCOVI approved, um, it, there were higher rates of triglyceride elevation, um, also weight gain um, in the DISCOVI arm. So this just led to the recommendation that lipid monitoring should be recommended um, yearly in all the oral agents. Kidney function, um, I think we talked about a lot. Uh, we've discussed the renal impairment considerations, um, so you just monitor throughout as well, but you don't have to worry about that with the injectable option. Um, hepatitis, uh, Truvada, Discovery are actually active against hepatitis, um, but you want to be able to test for that and know what you're treating. Uh, pregnancy, uh, and then some STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Um, since you are uh, treating a patient with our PrEP, prophylaxing um, for kind of these risky behaviors, um, but PrEP does not protect you in regards to pregnancy or STIs. We do want to be checking that every four months and, and three months for the oral options. All right, so we made it through oral and injectable, so all our FDA approved options. Um, now, in the last few minutes or so, I'll just discuss some investigational products in the pipeline. All right, so this is really just a big overview of the FDA approved um, PrEP products, including some investigational products. So I'm just gonna touch on um, the vaginal ring there, lenacapavir and isletravir, specifically in the next few slides, just because they've re recently been discussed in the news here. So this first ring, this is the vaginal ring. It's a long acting vaginal ring. It's dosed just once a month. Um, it's used in adult women in developing countries. Um, it actually received a recommendation from the World Health Organization in 2021. It's improved in, it's already approved in Zimbabwe. Um, it has regulatory reviews pending in other countries in Africa. It's actually already currently under review by the FDA. Um, so I, I, I termed this as in the pipeline. Um, there's been a couple of studies as well, the RING study, as well as the ASPIRE trial. These were uh, sister phase three trials that both showed HIV risk reduction of 31%. And then the ASPIRE trial showed a risk reduction of 27% as well. Um, so very effective. So that's the dapavirine based vaginal ring. So keep your ears open for this one. The next one that um, is in the pipeline, or maybe I should have termed back in the pipeline, is lenacapavir. It's a long-acting injectable, a super long-acting injectable. It's, it's dosed twice yearly. Um, so this is an investigational drug. There were a couple different trials. There was the purpose one. This was adolescent girls and young women who were at risk of acquiring HIV. And then purpose two was cisgender men and transgender women, as well as transgender men. So there was a clinical hold placed in December 2021. There was uh, concern about just the compatibility of the vials with the solution. Um, as of May 2022, the study is actively recruiting and trials are restarted. So back in the pipeline. <laughs> so keep your eyes and ears open for this one as well, because I think this would be great for adherence, just a twice yearly injection. So I have uh, coined this one as stuck in the pipeline, um, but still worthy to discuss because it's been in the news. It's Islatravir. It's a once monthly oral tablet. Um, the mechanism is super cool. First in class, it's a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. So NRTTI, it has multiple mechanisms of action. Uh, super long half-life, um, like I mentioned, it's just dosed once a month. Um, there were two main efficacy trials that I listed here. There's Empower 22 and Empower 24. 
Um, those were just the, the PrEP trials, but it was also um, a studied with HIV positive for treatment. But in, in all Islatravir studies, they saw lymphocyte and, or specifically CD4 cell decline. So due to this decline in December 2021, um, all Islatravir clinical trials are placed on hold. Um, and unfortunately, all PrEP Islatravir clinical trials are discontinued. The HIV treatment ones um, came back to life in September, but it was decided that PrEP is latrovir clinical trials to be discontinued. I still included it because um, there was a lot of talk and a lot of news reports that came out at the end of last year. And who knows, maybe in the future it'll come back, but for right now it's it's all been discontinued. So again, just to kind of round out how expansive current research is, I wanted to include this slide here. Just take a look at um, this. This drive is just largely stems from that end HIV campaign. So just a really exciting time in, in prep research and HIV research. Okay, so getting to the end here um, again, just recapping the pharmacist role. Um, I really kind of kind of think it's identifying prep candidates. Um, you know, candidates and recognizing that huge disparity in patients who qualify for PrEP um, and are actually taking it will help identify those target populations. Um, I know I already kind of exemplified and talked about the populations that maybe we can um, we can find from chart review, but, you know, like IV drug users, um, patients with a history of STIs, um, super easy to find on chart review or on intake and um, great interventions on rounds. Um, that's without even talking to the patient. So um, I think that's a great intervention. Of course, patient counseling and education. Um, I should have included patient and provider education. It's a big piece of our discussion today, just to break down those barriers of stigma, awareness, and, and side effects. Um, drug interactions too. So, you know, always included in our patient counseling, but highlighted specifically with PrEP. Um, and even more specifically with Apertude or the Cabotegravir, just since has some particularly contraindicated medications and with it being newly approved, important to be aware of those. So, in, in conclusion, uh, covered a lot of different PrEP barriers, including stigma, access, side effects, cost and awareness, and some different or plausible pharmacist specific interventions and solutions. And if, if you're just tuning in to sign out, I totally respect that. But if you take away nothing else, um, I wanted to leave you with the importance of, of PrEP, um, hiding that, you know, when taken as prescribed, it reduces HIV incidence by up to 99%. So utilization is really important and really important to stress to providers and patients. Um, and also we covered, you know, three FDA approved options for PrEP. There's just a variety of developing PrEP formulations as well that may be coming to market in the future. So keep your eyes and eyes and ears open there. So happy to take any questions. Um, references are there. And there's the code as promised.